The RTX 3080 has just been released and right now everyone's eyes are either on the Founders Edition for its Apple-esque design or the Gigabyte Eagle for its performance. But hold fast, my brothers, for there is a far better option in our midst. An option unscathed by the disgusting gamery design choices of the industry. An option that doesn't compromise on performance or just about anything. This is the Gigabyte RTX 3080 Vision, one of the most stunning looking graphics cards I've seen to date. Much like the Hall of Fame cards we've seen in the past, the Vision sports a full white and brushed metal shroud with a fully black PCB. On the face of the card, you're greeted with two 100mm fans and one 90mm fan. Much like the Founders Edition 3080, this card also features this pass-through cooling design, assisting with airflow and enabling more effective heat dissipation. Flip her onto her belly and you'll find a simplistic silver metal backplate, the Vision and GeForce logos. I don't really have any complaints for the aesthetics, although I would always prefer the backplate to be void of any writing for a cleaner look, but the card is so goddamn pretty that you can easily let this slide. This GPU was built by Gigabyte 4 creators, which doesn't mean much besides the fact that creators like to film their graphics cards and computers, much like I'm doing now. This would mean for the design team, clean lines, no weird geometric patterns, looking at you Asus, and also colours that are going to exaggerate LED lights within the case, but without forcing grotesque RGB down the customer's throat. And I feel like they've really delivered on that. That's right, that LED on the side is just a white LED, so you won't need any software to stop it puking rainbows within your case, and because everything's white, this card will go with literally any build out there. The build quality is incredible, I was literally admiring this card out on my table for a good hour or so before actually putting it in my PC. But oh boy, putting it in your PC is the best feeling ever. Much like with the Founders Edition, this card gives a sense of prestige, and that prestige doesn't just stop there, but extends to its features and performance too. Starting off, let's take a look at that powerful I.O. You'll notice that we have two HDMI 2.1 ports and three DisplayPort 1.4a ports. It's nice to know creators were kept in mind first, multi-monitor setups and VR headsets are a common occurrence for them, and so it's nice to see creators are catered for here. Outside of that, the card's clocked to 1800MHz on the core and 19000MHz on the memory. Differences in comparison to other models include two 8-pin power connectors and the GPU itself measuring 32cm long and 12.6cm wide. The GPU can be bought for £750 for the base model and £800 for the OC model. Similar prices apply in the US. Before we take a look at what £800 buys you in terms of FPS, I wanted to go over the untapped potential of this card, made possible through the ancient art of overclocking. My PC consists of an i7-8700K on an ASUS Maximus 10 motherboard with 48GB of RAM. The benchmark of choice is Unigen's Superposition 8K benchmark. This is the program I'll be using to test the stability of my overclocks, uh, and I can also compare the performance of these overclocks by seeing my sort of graphics score, and then compare them to the performance of other 3080s. After tinkering with the card, I've narrowed it down to three modes which I deem best, and you choose based on your preferred gaming environment. First, there is silent mode, where you set your fans to run at 62% speed in MSI Afterburner as soon as temperatures start ramping. 62% fan speed is the fastest speed you can run uh, before you notice any noise. The second mode is an aggressive mode, which runs the fans at 80% with that same aggressive curve. This is because speeds above 80% produce noise levels you can hear while gaming through speakers. This will provide the most performance while still being within comfortable parameters in terms of noise. The final mode is the Brute Force Max Performance mode. Obviously fans are pegged at 100% and it sounds like a jet taking off, but funnily enough, it's when you try this that you realise just how effective this cooler is. But more on that in a minute. Let's compare the modes in terms of real world performance numbers and average stable clock speeds. Okay, so our stock results say we got an average of 1797 MHz from the core clock, with a max of 1965 MHz and a minimum of 1560. We averaged 46.4 FPS with an average GPU core temperature of 75 degrees Celsius and a max of 80. Despite the temperatures, the card was dead silent, you can't hear a thing at stock speeds because the fans are barely spinning. Let's compare this to my tinkerings. On silent mode, you will notice a considerable drop in average temperatures, going down to 65 degrees Celsius from 75. 
as a result in this drop in temperature. Core clocks boosted up to 1974 MHz on average, 2160 MHz maximum, and 1935 MHz minimum. That's a 375 MHz increase on the minimum, 195 increase on the maximum, and a 177 MHz increase on the average. This means that frame rates were more consistent and overall higher and stuttering occurred less frequently. This is while being silent under the sound of gameplay. Interestingly enough, the aggressive mode yielded similar results in the average core clocks remaining at 1974 MHz. The maximum core clock had dropped to 2055 MHz, but the minimum core clock jumped up slightly to 1950 MHz. The average temp only dropped 1 degree to 64 degrees Celsius, which meant that the extra fan speed was only wasting more power for unnoticeable gains to the 1% and 0.1% lows. It's for this reason I see the silent mode as the best option. My final overclock was plus 186 MHz on the core and plus 509 MHz on the memory. This gave us an average FPS of 50.5, a 4.1 FPS improvement over stock, while also being 10 degrees cooler. I mentioned that last mode, the brute performance one, no one ever has their fans pinned to 100% in any normal case, but you can see how well the cooler distributes air around the card and dissipates the heat effectively by trying this. For example, in comparison to the aggressive mode, an extra 20% fan speed gave a 5 degrees Celsius reduction in temperatures to 59 degrees average, when the GPU was mid full load as well. It may have been noisy, but this cooler gives you great flexibility in how you want your car to perform. The best part about this is it getting 5 FPS away from RTX 3090 performance for almost half the cost. So that's the cooler's performance and overclocking covered. Now let's go on to some benchmarks. We'll be including stock and overclock results. Do bear in mind the overclock results include a 5 GHz overclock to the CPU. In games, the core clock of the GPU seems to be greater than what we saw in the Unigen benchmark, with averages hovering from 1977 to 2077 MHz. Let's take a look at the performance. Alright, so benchmarks are all well and good, and numbers are cool to compare, but what's the actual experience like? Is it worth buying a 3080 when you could probably pinch a 2080 Ti for 500 quid? And the answer to that? Yes! Absolutely! But this decision is only clear if you're able to take advantage of the new features this generation of hardware brings. On the rear of the card, you'll notice two HDMI 2.1 connectors. These are capable of transmitting 4K at 120Hz with G-Sync or FreeSync technology, and HDR, or they can do the same thing but with 8K 60Hz. The choice then is either go with an 8K TV and fail to get 60fps, or get a 4K OLED, which actually more often than not looks better than an 8K backlit TV, and have a fantastic crack at experiencing high refresh rate gaming and all of the visual delights that come with 4K. So that's exactly what I did. This is the LG OLED C9. This is the crown jewel of gaming displays, one year mature now. And if you can have one of these, buying a 3080 or even a 3090, if you've no brains like myself, becomes a no-brainer, if you'll pardon the pun. The 3080 is more than capable of achieving frame rates comfortably above 60fps at 4K, especially if you turn the settings down a smidge. I've managed to play Red Dead Redemption 2 at 4K over 100 FPS and I'm currently having a blast playing Modern Warfare multiplayer, couch gaming style with all of the benefits of gaming at a monitor on the desk. Perhaps you don't like couch gaming and a monitor is more your style, and I'd say if you own an ultra wide then a 3080 is again a no brainer. Larger resolution displays like the Samsung CRG9 require a lot of GPU power to run the 5120x1440 display at 120fps. A 1080Ti is needed minimum for this monitor, a 2080Ti still hovers around 60 in some titles, but a 3080 makes this monitor shine like a bright penny, achieving high figures with ease. 
I know I could have just said it depends on your resolution, but I don't know. Maybe I wanted an excuse to show off these two beautiful displays. The Founders Edition sure does look pretty, but in my opinion, I'd choose this Gigabyte Vision card every single time. But anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video or have some beef to square, then link me in the comments and we can get talking. I am Trite and I'll see you guys in the next one. Hurrah!